Hi, it's Tim Hagen from Progress Coaching. And this week I'm going to be teaching the fourth segment of our eight week program called Coaching to Uncertain Times. And this week's topic is about engagement. Now, let's be blunt it's overused. Everybody uses the term engagement, workplace engagement studies. You've got to be engaged. We have people who are disengaged. I think the Gallup organization does some awesome work in this area. And I was looking at the statistics and it was startling. And it was really revealing what's going on in the corporate workplace. Here's the funny thing. Some of the data was good. Some of it was not so good. And it got me thinking, where's our new workplace culture? People are now working at their homes. Some people want to continue to work at their homes. So how do we go about coaching people to be engaged, to maintain engagement when things have dramatically shifted so quickly? Also think about one other thing. What if you're a new manager or if you have new managers at your organization? 99.9% .9 of us have not been through a pandemic before. And they're actually now dealing with new teams, people that report to them. That's tough. So let me walk you through what I found out that I think you'll find very interesting. So this is part of the presentation we're actually giving. And when you think about some of the definitions of coaching to engagement, the emotional commitment the employee has to the organization and its goals, how do we know those things when they're so distant? Emotional connection that an employee feels towards his or her employment organization, which tends to influence his or her behaviors and level of effort in work-related activities. And according to the Gallup organization, engaged employees are those who are involved, enthusiastic about and committed to their work and their workplace. Quantum Workplace defines employee engagement as the strength of the mental emotional connection employees feel towards their place of work. Wouldn't you agree that some of that's wavered in recent weeks because of everything going on? Now, here's where we get into some of the statistics. 85% of employees are not engaged in the workplace. According to the Gallup organization, only 15% are engaged in the workplace. 29% of employees are happy with their career advancement opportunities. Think about that. Only 3 out of 10. And according to Sherman, their 2017 employee job satisfaction report, only 29% of employees are very satisfied with current career advancement. How do we have those conversations when we don't have advancements? And more, one in three professionals cite boredom as their main reason to leave their jobs. Here's the funny thing about people who are bored. They're bored. They typically don't speak up. They start to look for other jobs or they're more open to when a recruiter calls them. According to the Corn Ferry Survey, 33% of those changing jobs cite boredom and the need for new challenges as the top reason why they're leaving. Companies with highly engaged workforces are 21% more profitable. And last, the Harris Poll shows that 91% of the surveyed employees think that their leaders lack communication skills. Now, let me defend a little bit of the communication skills, okay? When I think about communication skills, I also think we have a responsibility as a good employee to do what? To listen. And I share this with leaders all the time. Assume people hear 25% of your message. So to get to 100%, find four ways to deliver that message. And according to the Edelman Trust Barometer, almost one in three employees don't trust their employees. That's alarming. Again, low employee engagement costs companies between four to $500 billion each year. Disengaged workers take less responsibility and ownership of their attitude, behavior, and motivation and can drain overall productivity. Now, let me make this comment. Not only do they drain productivity in the organization, they drain people around them. So I shared with you some statistics. So what do we do? What's our next steps? How do we build or rebuild engagement? How do we help our new managers do that? Let me give you a couple quick strategies. First, schedule coffee breaks. I know it's dumb. I know it's cliche. Schedule coffee breaks between your employees, between yourself as a leader. 
and between people of other departments and make this a requirement. I just want you to find out two unique things about that person you didn't know. When we provide something like that, which we call a learning project in the progress coaching world, you're facilitating something so fundamentally missing so often. The ability to ask questions and to really listen. Not only to listen to respond, but to listen to understand where somebody's coming from. Who are they? What are they about? What are their hobbies? What do I have in common with that person? Number two, schedule strength-based feedback sessions. Call people in, put people on a Zoom interaction, and just praise them for a job well done. You want to freak out your employees? Have your boss in the office or have your boss in the Zoom interaction. Here's why. They're going to think, uh-oh, what did I do wrong? And now you start to praise them. And you want to be specific. You don't want to just give nebulous feedback like, John, I think you're doing a great job. You want to give specific feedback. John, your last two reports were really spot on. They were very specific. I love the graphs. Graphs, you really represented the data well. Be specific. Third, schedule visibility chats. A visibility chat is when we call people in whether it be virtually or in person, and ask people that report to us, what are you seeing that potentially I'm not seeing? And here's the key. Do not rebuttal. Do not respond with the yeah, but. They will never walk through your office again. You are there to just listen, not to respond. Fourth, schedule some group activities. It can be virtual. It can be in person. But schedule group activities where people are talking and having fun and engaging and conversing. And it can be as simple as 20 minutes a day. And recently I was watching the show The Office and I love, I just love the show. I love the humor behind it. And probably doesn't say a lot about me considering what I do for a living. Yet they did something that was so funny. Michael Scott would always call people into the conference room. Conference room, five minutes. Yet they were always together as a group. And then their office was open setting. And somebody inevitably at every episode always stopped and said, I have an announcement. And as corny as that sounds, sometimes we just need to sit and talk. Now, when I go back to some of the statistics, we have to strengthen relationships at a foundational level. And that's why I gave you those suggestions. The second thing is become skilled in having a career-based coaching conversation. Two fundamentals for you. One, make sure you understand their motivation. People who are intrinsically motivated love what they're currently doing. They're okay with where they're at. Extrinsically motivated employees see their current situation as a potential stepping stone. Don't assume what motivates you motivates somebody else. Number two, when you're having a career-based coaching conversation, find out their ideal situation. Ask them, what's your ideal job? What's your ideal situation? If you find someone who's extrinsically motivated, very few people have that question asked to them. Ask them that question. What is your ideal situation? Here's the funny thing. Think about it in three columns. Once you ask that question, you write down in column one the person's strengths in areas where they feel like they can improve. Okay. Then you go to the far right of the piece of paper or the whiteboard, and in column three, you write down your ideal job. Then you go to column two, the middle, and you say to somebody, what do we need to do specifically in your estimation in the middle part to get you over to the far part of this white board or this uh, piece of paper? And what that does, it gets them to visualize what they need to do to change. It's a visualization technique. Whiteboard coaching is awesome for career-based coaching conversations because one, they've got to see who they are right now, where they want to go, and what is that gap? And you notice the phrase I use, what we need to do to move you in that direction. That's what will increase employee retention when people are dissatisfied. Now, how do we have that conversation when we don't have promotions available? So one of the statistics I did not cover was that people due to boredom really want projects outside of their current job that will offset that boredom. And we don't do that enough. And what we tend to do is when somebody is bored and they're doing a good job, what do we do? We tend to ignore them because we're dealing with all these problems and situations over here. 
Conversations are vital. And I shared this at the start of the pandemic and I'll share it now. And I share it wherever I go. The number one objection we get when we work with clients or anybody for that matter is we don't have time to coach. How could anyone in their right mind say that today? So let's take a situation. Before the crisis, what if there was a manager who was coaching, scheduling time, investing in the good things, acknowledging and praising people versus somebody who said, I just don't have time. Now we go four weeks later and we've got to engage with these people online. And oh, by the way, when we get back to the new normal, we've got to maintain or continue those conversations. Which of those managers is in a better position to do so? It's the manager who was already coaching. So there are two thoughts for you if you're a leader. One, conversations are powerful. Do not assume that you and your fellow leaders have mastered the conversation. Here's why I can prove that. I've been teaching this for 23 years and I am still struggling with some things. We all do. So recently I got certified in emotional intelligence. My lowest score was empathy. I knew it was going to be empathy. My score wasn't really bad. But since that assessment, it got me thinking, Am I, I'm really not the most empathetic person in the world. And I've been really conscientious of being more empathetic, not because of the crisis, just in general. Number two, how often do you, do we have conversations with people and we're thinking about what we want to say while somebody's talking? Guilty. We all do it. And that's what I mean. We have not mastered the conversation. So often, what we tend to do when we converse with people, we almost have what I call two agendas in the dark. I've got my agenda, that person's got their agenda. And it's almost like we're talking like this versus like this. I'll give you a case study. We were asked to sit in on a cross-departmental meeting and the cross-departmental um, situation was at one of our client sites. It was not part of the project we're doing for them. And someone asked me to sit in it was really interesting and they had already had two meetings and I was sitting in on the meeting and I started to write down some slash marks and the person who asked me to sit in said, what are you writing down? I said, I'm writing down the nonverbal cues of discord. He said, what are you talking about? I said, watch when somebody's talking, the other person is doing this or they're rolling their eyes or they turn away. They're showing discord before the person even finishes, which does what to emotion? It elevates it. So we got done and I think I counted, it was like 29 acts of discord in like the first 19 minutes. And I think of 29, 20 were done before the other person was even done talking. So emotion, there was, it was combustible. Here's the funny thing. So the person asked me to sit in on the meeting and said, well, what do we do? And I said, create a rule of engagement facilitate and have an objective of quality conversation. Go into the next meeting. Don't worry about a resolution. Don't worry about a solution, but have an objective of quality conversation. He said, well, how do we do that? If you're going to speak, you have to acknowledge the person before you by stating back what you understood or paraphrase what they said or meant. And what that is, is active listening. And what it did is it slowed down the cadence of yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but we, and the argument, the rebuttal, the quick pushing back. And it was funny. I was not in that meeting and my client called me and said, it was amazing because so often people were stating back what they thought the other person mentor said. And there was a lot of clarification and I started to laugh and he said, what are you laughing at? I said, you know, we're all guilty of this as well. People need to listen factually versus listen emotionally. Think about that. How often when we're talking to somebody, can we see them getting revved up? I've been in so many situations in my career where employees will say, oh, management just doesn't care about us. They just don't care. And I always ask this question, how do you know they don't care? Well, you can just tell. I said, well, how can you tell? Well, it's just by the way they act. I said, well, how are they acting? And really what I'm doing is I'm, I'm revealing to them. I'm hopefully building some self-awareness. Mind you, a little bit aggressively. No one ever came out and said they don't care. Can you imagine a CEO or a VP coming out and saying, we just want to let the masses know we don't care about you. 
So what they're doing is they're emotionally listening. They're emotionally interpreting. They're emotionally spinning. And oh, by the way, do they share those feelings? Oh yeah, there's a groundswell. And the version of what was said gets twisted 12 times. That's what happens. That's where mastering the conversation for employees, for middle management and upper management gives us an opportunity when we get back to the new normal. Let me explain. So often employees need to converse with each other. They need to learn conversational skills. Peers who are in management need to give each other feedback where it's not taken defensively. Here's the big one. Upper level management wants people to come to them and share. Guess what upper level management? They don't do that because they don't trust you. You know why? They fear retribution. They fear the political hole they're gonna fall into. Doesn't mean it's an objective. So when someone comes to you and they're communicating upward, just listen. Don't tell them they're right or wrong. Just listen, state back to them. Tell them you're gonna digest it. Give them some security that they're okay. That will increase the flow of conversation upward. See, coaching cultures are multi-directional. They're not just one direction from the top down. So when we think about engagement and we think about where we're at before the crisis and now coming out of the crisis, whenever that's gonna be, do your employees know how to converse? Do they know how to communicate upward? Can they have conversations of conflict thoughtfully and professionally? Are upper level management inviting people to come in to have what we call visibility chats so they can see what's going on in the front lines without assuming? Are peers able to give each other feedback without discord or rebuttal? That's what a great coaching culture is. So coaching and conversations will drive organizations going forward out of this crisis. I hope this has helped. Thanks for your time.